Family of God, when Jesus called his disciples to follow him, he said to them, follow me. And I'm going to give you something to do that you know absolutely nothing about. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, pardon? Fishers of men? What are you talking about? What are fishers of men? Now, you think that if Jesus wanted men to follow him, he would have said something like, men, follow me, and I'll make you rich. Or, follow me, and I'll make you smarter. I'll make you better fishermen. Follow me, and I'll give you a, a bigger house, a whole fleet of boats that you can fish in. But Jesus, being who he is, may have turned around and said something like, you know, follow me, and I will make you more spiritual, more holy, a better husband, more loving. Follow me, and I'll give you a, a better handle on the scriptures. But he didn't say that. He didn't say anything like that at all. And I'm sure that he confused them in what he did say to them. You know, for us, we know the story. We've read it many times. We've sung it when we were taught. We've heard it over and over again. We know what Jesus meant. But most likely, they were confused. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, the Lord's agenda that he spoke to them is the very same agenda that he has for us. Our purpose as well. And if we truly follow Jesus, we will be fishers of men. Jesus had gone up into the, the Galilee and began to preach. The kingdom of God is near. Repent, believe the, the good news, for the time has come. The kingdom of God was near. And God was going to do something radical, something wonderful. And whenever he does that, whenever God does something startling or wonderful, there is a call that goes out to repent, as we see it in the Old Testament. Recommit your life. Get right with God. He wants to talk to us. He wants to bless us. He wants to, to lead us. And, and, and the Old Testament was the case of being led into the promised land. And the same for us today. God's call in our lives is to repent and believe the good news. You see, it's not sin that separates us from God. It is a lack of repentance. But the call was there, a, a turning of their hearts, a, a change of their lives. Instead of following their old traditions, the, the traditions of the Father and their religious practices, now it was a question of turn to God, listen to his voice, and let him lead you. Jesus' repentance was exactly the same. Turn your attention to God so when he acts, you'll know it's him and what he's going to be doing. You'll understand his work and where he's at. You see, I love you, and I want you to be tuned in to what God is doing. And if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss out. They had to do something so they wouldn't miss out. Get your heart and life in line with God so that when he acts, you won't be asleep. Now, some time back, there was a lunar eclipse. And the best time to see this was 3.30 in the morning. And there were lots of folks who just didn't care. It didn't matter. There were others who wanted to see it, but, you know, 3.30 in the morning, kind of tough. Yet there were others who made the effort, who got up and saw this marvelous sight of the moon that had been covered by the sun, and it was just sort of what they call a, a blood moon, blood red. And they didn't miss out, but they had to do something. They had to get up. Well, what God was about to do was vastly more significant, and Jesus didn't want the people to miss out on what God's plans were, so he told them to do something, to repent, get right with God. 
He's going to do something special. Real soon, the kingdom of God is near. It's about to unfold, and I don't want you to miss out. And now Jesus is walking the shores of Galilee, and he called Simon and James and John. They were working on their nets, and Andrew was there as well. They didn't need to understand what he meant, and they didn't. But they followed him anyway. They left their nets without any hesitation at all. They left their nets, their boats, their families, their businesses, their, everything was left behind. And they followed after Jesus to do something they knew nothing about. These men and many, many others took what Jesus did and what he taught and they passed it on to others. And God used them to share the good news of the kingdom of God. That you didn't enter by religious ritual or, or sacrifice. You didn't come in by hard work. But by putting your trust in a person. About relationship. And that person was Jesus Christ. The son of God. God used them to be fishers of men. You see, it wasn't enough that they of themselves came to honor Jesus in their own lives, but they were also called to do the work of fishing for men. Because you see, part of what it means to follow Jesus is to be a fisher of men. And it wasn't just those four who were fishers of men. There was a tax collector there was a man who was filled with demons, a woman who had been married five times, blind men, beggars, jailers, slaves, even Pharisees followed Jesus and became fishers of men. And wherever you look throughout the, the entire New Testament, there is a connection between following Jesus and being a fisher of men. Now, as you look through the New Testament, there are times that it wasn't done right. They argued about who was going to be the, the greatest in the kingdom. And when it came time to, to cast out demons, the disciples had forgotten the power of prayer. And yet the Holy Spirit spoke to them and called them back to being those people of prayer. In order to cast out demons, they needed to be men of prayer. And they understood that being followers of Jesus was more than just following. It involved fishing. When Jesus called them to be followers, to be fishers, he was talking about more than just loving others. He was talking about more than being holy or being disciplined. Now, hopefully these are parts of things that, that happen in their lives as well. But Jesus called them to be fishers of men. He called me to be a fisher of men. He called us all to be fishers of men. And let's say that together. God called me to be a fisher of men. God called me to be a fisher of men. He calls us to follow him. He calls us to be more Christ-like, growing in spiritual fruit, exercising spiritual gifts, but also to do very much what others who have gone before us have done, to be fishers of men. Now, most of you, if not all of you here today, are here because someone went fishing. You see, once upon a time, you too were all fish. Fishers of men. Probably none of us really thought about what that meant, that God wanted that from us. After all, it had been impressed on us as we were growing up from the time we were, were little by our moms and our dads, our, our Sunday school teachers, that heaven was good, hell was bad. We didn't want to go to hell. 
So there was a pretty simple decision that had to be made. We needed Jesus. And so for most of us, it was pretty straightforward and maybe somewhat selfish. Some of us were honestly convicted of our sin. But I'd hazard a guess that for most of us, it was for selfish reasons that we turned to Jesus. Good reasons. And the Holy Spirit used them for the ultimate good, that we would indeed turn to the Lord. But we didn't want to go to hell. And so we decided to follow Jesus. Maybe there was that cute little gal that some of us were chasing. And so we knew we had to go to church. And so we followed Jesus. Perhaps it was, I need a better job. I have marital issues. God, if you get me out of this mess, I'm going to be yours forever. And so we followed Jesus because God would take care of our needs. It might surprise you to know that the disciples of old were exactly the same. They didn't follow Jesus just because of his words. There's more to the story of Christ's call to the disciples as we find it in Luke chapter 5. There we discover that Jesus did a miracle. The disciples had been out fishing. They'd been out there all night. They'd thrown their nets out time after time with no success. Nothing was caught. And it's just as the song says, they fished all night, but they caught no fishes. But now it's broad daylight. The sun's come out. It's higher in the sky. It's hot. And the fish are driven further away from the shoreline out into the deeps of the water. And now we have Jesus, the carpenter, standing on the shore, talking to the fishermen in their boats and saying, move out into deeper water and let your nets out. Peter's response almost sounds like he's uh, trying to humor Jesus. Well, because you say so, okay, I'll let down the nets. And they got a record catch. Their nets were not able to hold anymore. James and John came over to help them as best they could. But the catch was so large that both of their boats began to sink. They had never taken in such an abundance of fish. And as the story closes in verse 10, Jesus says, from now on, you will catch men. These men followed Jesus because he had done something for them too. If you follow me, I'm going to do something for you and you're going to become something you're not because Jesus' followers are to be fishers of men. Following me is not just about my, my blessing you. It's not about my helping you find the right mate, although it may be that. To choose the right career path, although it is that and more. All the things that I do for you will have eternal consequences and eternal value when you become a fisher of men. I'll use these things that I put into your life to accomplish my good pleasure in the lives of others. You know, most of what we pray about in, for ourselves and for others is this life-oriented God, bless my family, give me health, um, may my children not need braces as they grow up, that kind of thing. But God not only blesses us in, in a general sense, but we've all had occasion to look at things that have happened in our lives and say, wow, the only way that this could have happened is if God had been at work. And so what happens? God takes all these things that he puts into your life and he shapes you to be exactly the right person to be a fisherman. He shapes you and puts you in the right place to be the fisher of men that he wants you to be. Through your life experience, you are the right person to impact others in a relation to Jesus Christ. Your successes your failures, your highs, your lows, 
where you've grown up, the kind of car that you've been driving. It all comes together to make you uniquely the right person to be a fisher of men. Before we left Oregon, I had the privilege of fishing in one of these beautiful, beautiful mountain streams. And got there, opened my tackle box, and I took a look in, and I pulled out a, a silver spinner, put it on the end of my line, threw it out, and I, I worked that for about 15 minutes. Nothing. Absolutely nothing happened. So I put it back, and I pulled out a, a gold one. Threw it out, bang, I got that first hit. And it was a big one. I didn't, wasn't able to reel it in, but I saw it close enough. It had to be about like so and this thick. It was a beautiful fish. But it was big enough that it snapped the swivel off the, uh, the lure itself. And so, lost the fish. Grabbed a, another spinner out of my box, and it was a silver one. Tried it again a few more times. No luck with the silver one. Put the gold one back on, and I had some more strikes. And so it seems at that location, at that time, there was a particular lure that worked, while certain others didn't. And it's the same with you. In a sense, we're all the same, but we're all unique. Who you are and what's happened in your life, your hopes, your failures, your driving experience, your dating activities, hobbies, all these things will be used by Jesus to put himself into a place where he becomes obvious to others if you follow him and go fishing. Your life, my life, just plain old us will have incredible significance if we truly follow Jesus and do become what Jesus says he will make us to be, fishers of men. Probably most of us, you know, we don't think a lot of ourselves. We're just plain, ordinary folks. We don't have anything to pass on to somebody else. Pastor, who are you kidding? I'm not kidding anyone. Remember what Jesus said is, I will make you fishers of men. It's not about us other than, Lord, we want to be available for you. And Jesus is the one who takes what's temporal, what's momentary, and he gives it eternal significance when we become fishers of men and, and start sharing Jesus with others from our own lives. Here to take this life-giving message and share it with others. You are going fishing. Others need you to open up your experience of God in your life to them. It probably isn't about the Bible initially. See, when you tell people biblical facts, most of them have heard a, a good chunk of it one way or, or the other. But your life interacting with the scriptures is something that is new and different. And Jesus can use that to challenge, to encourage, to invite, to draw others. It's not just the message, but the message as it's taken hold in your life. Your sharing with somebody else what God has done for you may have eternal consequences for another. Jesus wants to use you to reel in another fish. The message and the right messenger at just the right time in the life of a hearer can be transforming. How do I know? I was once a fish. I'd heard the message many, many times. I'd gone to church from the time that I was a baby until I was 31 years old. But it was ultimately God's message working through the lives of others positioned into my life at just the right time that God used to reel me in. And I know that I'm not alone. You see, it's probably true for most of you who are sitting here this morning. There was someone out there 
that God sent on a fishing expedition. Oh, you wouldn't have called it that, but in essence, that's what it was from God's vantage point. A parent, a friend, pastor, youth leader, schoolmate, television evangelist, Sunday school teacher, God used someone to reel you in. Jesus had spoken into their hearts, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. They followed Christ. They were obedient to the call to be a fisher of men and because they did, you are here today. And I think that's the experience of most of us because you see, at one time, we were all fish. For me, God sent a pastor who had burn marks and black and blue marks on his legs. And he would stand on the pulpit. I know that because I'd seen them in catechism class many, many times as a youngster. And I remember seeing him standing on the pulpit, hands raised up, fists clenched, tears running down his cheeks using words joy and beautiful as he spoke about his God. It was there, so powerful. And it caused me to wonder about what it was that this man had. And I knew deep down in my own heart, I wanted and I needed. He sent another pastor into my life. I don't know why pastors in particular, but he sent another pastor into my life. And when he preached, there were times he would stop and sort of chuckle himself a little bit. It was as if he knew something, something special, and I wanted that for me, whatever it was. These men were my wrestling matches as I grew up. But ultimately, it was those in a, a Bible study that showed me the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in a way I had never seen it before. At a time when God had made me particularly vulnerable, and I grabbed on with both hands, and God never let go. As I worked through this message, I realized that I owed these people in the Bible study. I owed them a special thanks for going fishing. And so I wrote them a letter, never mailed it, but I wrote them a letter as to what they had done for me and my life. Here it is. Dear Bible study group, I've not done this before, and I should have. I want to say thank you for going fishing. When I walked into the Bible study at the Cools, that house so, that night so long ago, all of you, without exception, reached deep into my heart by being so open and just meeting me with the love of Jesus in a way I had never experienced it before. Even though I didn't realize it at the time, that's what I'd been searching for, hungering for actually, a genuine love and acceptance. And in Jesus, that's what you gave me. You said, come on in, we're getting to know Jesus. We love you. No one had ever touched my life like that before. That open and vibrant love was the love of God reaching out to me through you. There was life in your words. There was the reality of people who knew truly who Jesus is and had that relationship with him. And it was that reality, that love of God through you that moved me and spoke to my heart. Thank you for loving me and accepting me just as I was. Thank you, thank you, thank you for going fishing. Love, Ken. Once, we were all fish. Someone went fishing. 
this week, next week, I'd like you to take a little time to think through or think about who went fishing for you and what an incredible difference that has made in your life. Take some time to sit down and write a letter to the one or the one's God that used to especially impact your life for him. Just sit down, pray about it, think about it, write it to give thanks to the person or persons who were obedient to God's call to go fishing for you. Now, I know some of these people may not be alive today, but that's not even necessarily the point. It's in writing this letter that I hope you start to realize not only how important it was for you, but how important it is for you to go fishing for someone else. How important it is for us as followers of Jesus to go fishing. Sit down. Write the letter. Pray over it. Give thanks. And if you choose to, mail it. If not, feel free to hold on to it. Maybe at next week's service or the following week, uh, you can, in the, the time, you can share your letters with Pastor Dave and maybe the opportunity is here for you to uh, give glory to God by sharing how someone went fishing for you and what a difference that made. See, the point of this is to think through how important fishing for men and women really is. After all, once you were a fish. And then, praise God, someone went fishing.